Hello and welcome to episode 67 of the Pure Tokyo Scope podcast. I am Patrick Macias, the author of Tokyo Scope, the Japanese cult film companion. And I'm Matt Alt, the author of Pure Invention, How Japan Made the Modern World. 67, that reminds me of 1967. Isn't that when Ultraman debuted? Or is that 1966? Uh, that was 66. I think you're thinking of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. No, I only have room in my head for Japanese pop culture. So actually 67 is when Gage Gage no Kitaro came out. Does that count? What's bigger, Sgt. Pepper or Gage Gage no Kitaro? I want to know. That's a good question. I mean, whoever has like the newest show on Netflix, I think it's probably Gage Gage no Kitaro. But I mean, Sgt. Pepper is like worthy inspiration for the Super Sentai, weren't they? And, and Gotcha Man and all that we kind of We need to get stuff. Peter Jackson to do a, a, a long eight-hour documentary about Mizuki Shigeru coming up with uh, the Kitaro character or something. Ah, but episode 67, God, every single time you say one of these numbers that is higher in sequence than the last, I start to get cold sweats and think about how much time has passed. Yeah, we only have 368 more days to go until the Earth is destroyed, so we have to hurry back with the Cosmo DNA. In just one year, planet Earth will disappear. Are people going to start reevaluating Takashi Yamazaki's like not very good Yamato movie now in light of his new movie, Godzilla Minus One? I'm wondering if there's going to be a reappraisal like, yeah, actually, Troll 2 is actually pretty good. It's better than the original. There, there, is this the first time? So they just announced today, Toho, they being Toho. Whenever I say they in any context, I mean Toho. Uh, they have just announced that they are releasing a English subtitled version of Godzilla Minus One. That's a plus, I think. So maybe this is false advertising. The last Last time they did something like this in Japan, like a mass release of an English subtitled movie was Your Name. Kimi no Nawa was such a big hit that they oh, had wow. to release a subtitled version because they knew they were missing out on ticket sales. And they're doing that now with Godzilla Minus One. Did hundreds of thousands of people book tickets to Japan just to see Your Name in its native habitat? I wonder. Well, it sure looks that way for Godzilla Minus One. I mean, that is for sure. You know, it, it opened abroad. They had some test screenings abroad, did they not? And it's been getting pretty good reviews and from what I've been seeing. They they had the premiere at the uh, the DGA in LA. They had like the red carpet event in Hollywood, California. And I think several listeners were in attendance, such as uh, Orion Salazar. Oh, wow. He was there. Bob Johnson of Sci-Fi Japan. A few other people and names that I recognize. And were they like were they like along the side of the red carpet screaming as a tuxedo clad Godzilla <laughs> got out of the limo and walked into the theater? I don't think they had a guy in a Godzilla suit, sadly. I think it was because they had Michael Doherty and TJ Storm, the guys who made the American Godzilla movies and like they were the real monsters as I like to say. I, I that's that's kind of a letdown after what you what you witnessed in Hibia. Wasn't not only Godzilla was there but Jet Jaguar and Chibi Godzilla. Yeah, I don't like to compare them, Matt. They got to walk the red carpet. I'm sure they had like an open bar and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so the movie opens I think all across America, you know, for a few days limited engagement events on December 1st. So we're going to strike back. We're going to do a Godzilla minus 1 counterattack of our own with some additional content about yes the because i've i've had i have more feelings and thoughts on this you know the last time we spoke about it it was kind of moments literally after i'd gotten to the theater now i've had a chance to think about it so let's let's but let's shelve that for next time because we have so many important things to talk about today am i right well i think so but yeah it's important to say that yes we're going to come back probably with another round of godzilla minus one thoughts as an episode uh matt has his substack newsletter article all about what he really thinks about the movie i have an interview coming up on my Substack called I think it's going to be Godzilla minus one has a post-war Japan problem question mark question it is is there going to be do it YouTube style with your face like with your eyeballs all like popped out like what? raised eyebrow the rock style what? <laughs> exactly we just have to like milk that Godzilla thing for all it's worth I mean we just really have to ride this one well down. there's only another month and a half in the year and I plan on spending every single day thinking about Godzilla wait a second that's not different from any other time of the year if thinking about Godzilla all the time is wrong, I don't want to be right. But it seems that monsters come in many forms, Matt. Recently, Tokyo has been under siege by what do they call? You can have your, your chocolate or your vanilla here. There's the nuisance streamers, the kick streamers, and also now vigilante streamers like Bernard Getz. I can't keep track anymore. Bernard gets with a with a cell phone instead of a handgun. Yes, the Japanese umbrella term for these yahoos and bozos is meiwaku YouTube, and I'm sure YouTube really loves being linked in not only in the public perception, but like by mass media, like news organizations and stuff. I'm sure they like being linked to these kind of scum of the earth. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, streaming entertainers. But uh, so it goes on the wild streets of Tokyo, which we've talked about this a little bit before. We've hinted at it. We've never gone all the way there. I mean, it's a touchy subject. Obviously, everyone hates these guys. And, you know, the good news is they're one step lower than podcasters. So I feel like we should definitely be punching down here. <laughs> yeah, man. I can't. The thing I, the thing, the thing I hate most on this planet are people who just get together and talk and record their thoughts about Japan. It's just the worst. It's just the absolute worst. So it's actually been a real problem. It started what? Like, it, this wasn't a problem. And then suddenly it was. Like, about two or three months ago with the debut of a kaiju no human being could have even possibly imagined to invent if he hadn't invented himself. You know his name, Patrick. Should we not even say their names? I don't want to give these guys any more well, air. Well, I think you know who we're talking about. Yeah, I think you know who we're talking We're talking about a certain gentleman who showed up, snuck into construction sites, went into restaurants, screaming racist epithets. And streaming himself, doing it all the while, all in the hopes of taking a punch to the jaw so he could tell that the world that Japanese people were racist or something. I don't quite understand the logic because it's highly illogical. He was streaming on a platform called Kick and people are donating depending on whatever like wacky outrageous thing he does next. I mean, there's real things you can donate to. There's probably like a lot of children in need yes. and stuff like yes. that. But if you want to give your money to a Kick streamer, I, I you know, whatever, man, uh, please don't. Well, no, but this is, this is kind of the way it's going in... in in, in, certainly in, in America these days among, uh, I don't want to say among young people, you know, because there's just as many stupid old people out there as there are young people. But as a trend among the digital generation, it's obvious that streamers are the celebrities in more so than actual celebrities these days. Not the digital underground who should be the real celebrities out the there. The Humpty Hump? The Humpty, you know, people have been telling me, people, yo Humpty, you know, they've been saying to me that all of our references are from the 70s and 80s, Patrick, and it's dating us. But the digital underground is not the 80s. Give me a break. Come on. Well, they're like 1990. That's that's still the 80s. Is it not? Matt, Sex Packets, the debut studio album by the digital underground was released in 1990. So there. <laughs> so this there. Is after Stranger Things. The Stranger Things haven't done the 90s yet, so we're safe. Patrick, are Sex Packets real? I remember there being a big discussion in our high school. Sex Packets is a concept album about genetic suppression relief antidotes, a pharmaceutical substance that is allegedly developed by the government to provide its intended users, such as astronauts, with a satisfying sexual experience in situations where the normal attainment of such experiences would be counterproductive to the mission at hand. Were sex packets real? Are they real? After you called like 8675309 to ask for Jenny, you were like calling up your doctor to see if they had any sex packets? <laughs> God. <laughs> Oh, man. I, that was a great album, though. I actually saw him in concert at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. That was, uh, that was Those are the real streamers, man. Those are the real... Actually, didn't Humpty... He passed away recently, I believe, didn't he? I think he, he like, did, yeah. During COVID? God, too young, man. Too young. All of our heroes. Most of my heroes don't appear on no stamps. But if we live too long, we see terrible things, Matt, like these nuisance streamers. <laughs> So yes, nuisance streamers. So let's let's just say that right now there's two problems in Japan, and one is called Patrick, and the other is called Matt. No, they, there's two problems in Japan. One of which are these foreign nuisance streamers, and now there's an all new, semi new phenomenon that started to get attention over the last couple of weeks, which is Japanese domestic streamers. But they take a slightly different approach dis to disrupting society. They're like vigilantes for justice. Like they go hunt down Chikan, which is the name for what? What, what do you call? It? Groping? What do you call this? Train like train molesters? Train molesters? There's a, there's no there is the, the fact that there's like a single catch-all term for this in Japanese, and we need so many words to explain it in English probably says something. The fact that you need like vigilantes to go not only after them but also like live streaming this is just seems like it's very specialized entertainment. Am I using the right word here? I don't. Well, know you what... have these you have these jerky boy Westerners uh, and foreigners uh, coming into Japan and streaming obnoxious stuff to try to upset Japanese people people and provoke conflicts that they can stream to get more, I don't know, donations, if you know, fake internet, you know, likes, whatever on their channels. And the Japanese are like, you know, Japan is not a society where the disruption of public order or like getting in other people's faces is respected. Even like if you're kind of a punky outsider type person, like you're you just the, the idea of like,
like getting up in other people's faces for no reason at all whatsoever is just not embedded, I think, in the countercultural DNA, so to speak, of Japan like it is in the West. And so they, the, the Japanese nuisance streamers are doing something that they are spinning as being a pro for society, which is like tracking down and turning in perverts to the police. But in so doing it, they disrupt like train platforms, like they've caused like fist fights, they've caused people to tumble down stairs, like, and the cops are saying, don't do this. The, the train station saying, don't do this. But you know, it, it gets, it gets views. So people continue to do so. Citizens arrest to monetize on YouTube, man. Yeah. I mean, this is like get a real job. I mean, <laughs> it's no, it's a, it's kind of it's interesting seeing these different psychological manifestations of extreme online behavior because I, I just you know I, I never say never. I just don't think you're going to see people who are really actively trying to troll the public out in the open like you do in the in America. Like you know, in America, everybody's like an iconoclast. Everybody's an individualist. Everybody is suffering to a greater or lesser degree. I include myself in this from pro, like what is it protagonist syndrome, uh, where you think you're starring in your own movie, which is your life, and everybody else is kind of a side player. That I think is a lot of Americans' default for going through life. In Japan, like even if you are a total societal dropout, loser, weirdo, fringes of society, I don't think you see yourself that way. So these kind of weird behaviors manifest in different ways. Again, with these vigilante guys, I, I never could have predicted this happening, but but here it is. Here we are. It's the world we live in. What they need to do is put the nuisance streamers and the vigilante YouTubers together on like the same island with explosive net collars. And then like the areas get smaller and smaller as the amount of people die. I don't know. This is an I I think I've seen this movie. I saw these guys on Twitter. They call themselves vigilantes. A guy called Dark Jacket. And him and his friend, they dress up like tokusatsu superheroes. And they go around with tongs collecting trash in the streets of Shibuya. See, that's 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 wholesome. That's wholesome. And actually, Two Channel started out that same way with like a beach cleanup. But then like it degenerated into what Two Channel became. So, you know, maybe these, maybe it's before long we're going to be seeing tokusatsu clad people doing all sorts of nuisance streams. This is the thing. When you say vigilante like we're from the u.s i'm thinking like charles bronson death wish bernard <laughs> yes, gets like exactly, a yes. guy cleaning up trash with a pair of tongs just i don't really know if you're a vigilante i think i think vigilante is vigilante works for those dudes who are trying to bust like pervs on the train i, I don't think it works they're using the word like shijin which is written with the kanji for like watashi and 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 like person and it basically means private you know somebody doing something on their own own, you know, accord, not under the aegis of any organization or something Wait, so like that. so this is like Police Academy 4, Citizens on Patrol? <laughs> it is. It is. It's exactly what it's like. So, you know, you, the vigilantes are the vigilantes. Those those like trash picker uppers are just, you know, they're the quicker picker upper. They're, those people are good. I respect them. I love them. You know, I really respect those guys, Patrick. I do. Everybody should pick up garbage. So those guys are helping. That's awesome. I'm actually, I don't want to make fun of them. I'm, I'm all, I'm all no, for No, but it. I mean, like with one hand, they've got the tongue picking up the uh, the ice cream lid off the street and with the other hand they've got the selfie stick so it's sort of like You're, that that's getting into this whole thing of, of like somebody somebody online called what do they call it charity tantrums like when you throw like when you you have a big like your entire YouTube channel is about like making some kind of wild and crazy donations to some underprivileged country or some people and then you get really angry when like society at large doesn't like feed you for it except I don't think that the people doing this in Japan really expect any kind of like social following or anything. I think they're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. Remember that like tiger mask guy who was like anonymously donating all the toys to orphanages and stuff? I think that's what's going on here, that kind of thing. They want to be uh, heroes of justice. Was it Segi no Hero or something like that, right? Yeah, and think it just in America's we don't need another hero <laughs> as the song goes, right? So this is the whole difference right there. That's the difference in, so in societies. <laughs> right there, Patrick. But you know, what's interesting is we're starting to see pushback. A lot of places, especially in, in busy areas like Shibuya, like, you know, Kabukicho, Shinjuku are putting up signs saying no streaming of any kind allowed, no filming. You know, if we catch you, we're going to throw you out. This is being done on a shop by shop level. There hasn't been any ordinance passed or anything yet, but some people are saying that is in the cards. Okay. But this is crazy because that used to be the norm. You used to go to like a collector's place like Mandarake and there were like no camera, no photo, no video stickers everywhere. This used 
used to be around like, you know, 2009, 2007. And then they gave up. They stopped. For some reason, they stopped doing that. Why do you think that was? And now you can go in there and take all the pictures and videos you want. I don't think they gave up so much as, I don't know if you've noticed, Patrick, have you been to Mandarake recently? It's actually full of foreign people. I think there's a lot of foreign people working at Mandarake these days. And I think a lot of those people drilled into the upper echelon of management that the people filming things inside Mandarake were actually doing Mandarake a service. Mandarake doesn't own the image rights to any of the stuff they sell. Like, you know, if there's like a Gundam model kit, it's not like they're the rights holders or something like that. So like, why are they spending all of this effort trying to stop people from filming a product that isn't even theirs? Okay, this is interesting because the last time I went to, I guess, Mandarake in Akihabara, there was a gentleman with a cell phone doing what's called what live e-com. You've uncovered another species of nuisance streamer. Yes. Yes, people who do basically like live, not auctions, there's like walking around shops with a live stream being like, do you want this? Do you want this? And like conducting business on their cell phone and somebody else's business, right? That sounds about right. Yeah. And Mandarake, as far as I know, is cool with it. But I think it's some of like the smaller, more handmade kind of like design festa, I think kind of more arts and crafts kind of places. They're horrified and they have signs that say like no live streaming, no live e-com. But I mean, this is like, you know, trying to hold back the tide in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also I I kind of only have limited sympathy for a lot of these plays. I mean, people should be allowed to set the rules in their own house, so to speak. I believe in that. But so many Japanese like, you know, designer makers of all sorts of products artificially limit the demand of their product uh, on purpose to gin up interest and to, you know, be able to justify charging ever higher prices for like a t-shirt or a little tiny action figure or something like that. And that's fine. That's like late capitalism, like whatever you want to call it, you know, that's fine. But when you do stuff like that, you know, it's like Batman and the Joker. Like you created me. These guys, these guys create this kind of excessive behavior because their behavior is sort of excessive in a way. You know, the person we need to have on talking about this is one W. David Marks because his, you know, interest in that kind of streetwear sales, which where they would like, you know, you'd go into a shop, you couldn't even pick the article of clothing you wanted to buy. You couldn't pick the size. You didn't even know where the store was until like five minutes beforehand it would be some pop-up. That kind of like extreme streetwear selling, you know, behavior uh, has taken off in all echelons of the Japanese content production world. And so we're seeing it like toys, we're seeing it, you know, games, we're seeing it in all sorts of ways. So yeah, I like to just go in someplace and pay money and get something. I don't like lotteries. I don't like any of these kind of wacky, you know, street-y type pop-ups, like special things. You have to wait in line. And yet I have seen you go like Arnold Schwarzenegger commando style. <laughs> style at like Wonderfest. <laughs> like you know exactly where you want to go, like the one day only limited edition good and like you're on it. That's different, Patrick. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> no, that's those are events though, you know, like big big convention like events. Like that's that's what that kind of thing is all about. Like we've set up a one day free for all. It's interesting you bring that up because I think a lot of that kind of selling behavior you're talking about where like you do limited runs and things like that. It was all it was all kind of inspired by the way those fan of conventions went and people are trying to get that same kind of excitement and juice without having to be in a convention situation. So, but yeah, I guess those, to get back to the topic, the, the people who do that, there's a word for it in Japanese. I cannot remember what it's called, but like when you walk through the store with your kid, and look, there's a big difference between that and like what we do at Mandarake, right? Because I've seen you whip out phone and take pictures of some what? X plus Godzilla figure or something from time. I'm telling Mandarake next time. You've done that, right? Back in the day, I wouldn't have done that because that right. was the rule and there were stickers everywhere. And I knew that some guy would come up to me making like a, the sign of the cross with his arms and like <laughs> shooting his spacium beam at me until I blew up. But now th- no one cares. It's almost not no. even fun to try to take pictures there no, anymore. No, no. And I think this actually, a lot of this started because people were taking pictures of stuff and like, you know, emailing it to their friends and being like, hey bro, you looking for this? And then they would buy, like Andorica has stands to gain nothing from stopping people from taking pictures. They're probably not even going to be upset about that whole, you know, what do you call it? E-commerce streaming type person because they're still buying stuff. They might get a sale out of it yeah mandarake has always felt like kind of a wretched hive of scum and villainy i mean that's its whole that's its whole charm so i you know it's it's kind of like a a massive black market to begin with so i don't think you're going to see anything there but i've definitely seen signs you know saying you can't do it in akihabara especially like electronic shops you know i wonder if most of the people doing that are selling like streaming back to asia like the asian mainland certain countries whose name i will not mention yeah my autobiography 
as published by Playboy Press will be called You Can't Do It in Akihabara. <gasps> Akihabara. Well, Akihabara used to be a free for all. Remember, long before there were nuisance streamers, you had those chica idols, the underground idols who were performing on the street. Remember that whole boom? That was like two thousand eight, nine. So that was, I guess, kind of a, a premonition, if you would, uh, of some of this kind of behavior. Because that you couldn't really stream or do anything back then. That was what two thousand nine. I'm gonna say two thousand seven, two thousand nine was kind of that like chica idol, underground idol craze in Akihabara during, I guess, the Hokoten. They yeah, would have like yeah, yeah, streets yeah. roped off and just a bunch of girls and made outfits would come out there uh, you know just i'm you know this is a blast from the past but that was the, my first show i ever did on nhk world was for tokyo i remember that tokyo i chris pepler yes my first episode ever was with chica idols we were covering them we actually like went around to a bunch of them on the street and then we followed them like one group back to a concert venue where they performed did they know you were following them <laughs> It was, this wasn't like, this wasn't like a stalking thing. This wasn't like, I'll be watching you. See, another 70s reference. It was the 80s, Matt. It is. Oh, you're right. Synchronicity is 83. Jesus, God. We need, we need some references from the 2003s, man. I guess Chica Idols are, so that's okay. We're all, we're young and hip. I'm sure Taylor Swift will show up at Mandarake one of these days, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, we've already seen who, like Michael B. Jordan, who else has been? Didn't like Del Toro and and J.J. Abrams, your two the favorite Kardashians, filmmakers? Kardashians, Kanye. I mean, it's kind of game over, to be honest. They should just roll out the red carpet there. I mean, it's pretty it's much It's been written about, thing. it's been talked about so much. But, you know, so the whole thing about the Chica Idols was that it boomed for like two years. And you, every weekend, you could go and these kind of not really yet um they didn't have like contracts it was like young women trying to get recognized as idols or like kind of young u- units you know what do they call them idol units well they must have been brought in by all the heat generated by AKB48 who had their uh their right. stage show in Akihabara and that right. created this like the idol you can meet boom right where you can do the handshake event meet the idols try to saw their hand off get their heads shaved that kind of thing well does that sound familiar it sounds a lot like what streamers do which is that you can talk to them and interact with them while you're doing it. So, but then I'm sure you also remember why the underground idols are no longer a thing in Akihabara anymore. It was because a bunch of them started pushing the limits and doing like strip teases and stuff on the show on the street. Do you remember that? I I missed this. I didn't I didn't get to see this. But and you know I wonder how much of this is true and how much of it's urban legend. I I've heard conflicting theories about this. That either a some idols were like taking it all off so they were getting you know because the whole point back then was how many people were watching you perform. And what better way to get a crowd in Akihabara than show the the Denzians there something they've never seen before, which is an actual naked woman. Now, this is crazy. This is now sending like loopholes through time and space because I guess like a week ago, they had this like outdoor festival in Kabukicho, which is now like one of Tokyo's like biggest tourist spots, Shinjuku Kabukicho. Yeah, it's like all clean now, right? It's like a nice place to bring your kids. So they had this stage show where they have like a lot of like art, music, dance, and song, and they had like burlesque strippers get down to their pasties and like literally the only people watching them are like tourists with like people with like you know baby carts wait you know what? luggage oh man you know you can't have your cake and eat it too i this is they've been turning that place into a tourist trap for the last like t- this happened before even you know i guess when the hotel gracery with the godzilla on the roof went up that was kind of the beginning of the end but now that place there's literally more foreign people there than japanese people i'm actually kind of i don't know whether i'm pleasantly shocked or impressed or what the what the expression is that there somebody's still doing a strip tease there in the Did middle of the this? street like in the middle of a public place no but harajuku death squad got video of it there's like midgets running around it's like a fellini movie it's incredible wow okay well i guess there's still some degeneracy in the in the i would say the darker corners but this sounds like it was right out in the open uh way to go kabuki cho i guess wow so that's the thing is like something's changed some things have stayed the same it's not really entirely clear to me like i'm so traumatized from like that 2000 2007- 2029. It was forbidden. It was Kinjite to take film and video in so many places. And, yes. and now it's like everyone's, you're supposed to have a GoPro. You're supposed to have a selfie stick with you at all times. When social media wasn't a thing here for a long time, and I remember distinctly when Facebook localized for the Japanese market. And I was like, man, no way people are going to do this. Because up until that point, basically every Japanese social media network, whether it's a knee channel, two channel, or whether it's, you know, Futaba channel, or whether it's Mixi. Do you remember that? That was a big one. It was all basically anonymous. And they were all these, like, nobody could tell who you are, what you were doing on there, which really appealed to young people who just wanted to kind of let it all hang out in ways good and bad online. And when Facebook came, I was 
was like, no way. There's no effing way that Japanese people are going to sign up for this in any large numbers because I had just never seen Japanese people ever using their their real names online. And boy, was I wrong. Like it, it took off huge and basically swallowed the Japanese uh, social media, Facebook, YouTube. Two Channel is still around, but I don't think it's really doing anything. What are the other big social networks here? Instagram. I mean, TikTok, obviously. It's the same goddamn social media. Well, this is the thing. There's a great sameness to all of the you know social media all over the world, unless you're in China, which has that kind of great firewall around it. You know, it's interesting because Japanese arguably invented modern social media with Two Channel. Like Two Channel was the first social network to really kind of engage with society at large and really kind of send it into chaos in a lot of ways. And that happened way, way, way before, you know, 4chan or any of that stuff happened in the West. And so like by all rights, you would imagine Japan would have at least one successful social media network, but they don't. <laughs> they don't have one at all. Like, you know, Mixi, I guess, is still sort of around in a vestigial way, but they, they're kind of like conquered by, you know, uh, Korea's line, by China's TikTok, America's Facebook and Instagram and I don't know whatever else is out there. So it's it's kind of interesting now that this is boomeranging back and we're seeing, I, I don't think Japan was prepared for all of these nuisance streamers to come over, you know, and it's kind of the confluence of a lot of stuff. It's the weak yen because it's so cheap to come over here now. It's the fact that, you know, like two or th- for two or three years, humans existed only online. And I think, you know, it's the more sociopathic of them still kind of do and see things like nuisance streaming in the streets of Japan as some kind of fun thing to do. I don't know. Post pandemic, it was the number one country people wanted to come to was Japan. Yeah. So, and also it's just all the heat from all those video games, all that anime, all that manga kind of coming cool back. Cool Japan, dude. Actually, I have to, do you think, do you think, this is like a question for like Noah Smith more than either one of us, but what do you think when the yen eventually like strengthens and it's not like basically 50% off day every day, like it is now for people spending in dollars in Japan? I wonder, do you think, do you think less people are going to start? How much of this is money and how much of this is just like, oh, cool Japan? This sounds like a question for Bubba Smith, actually, from Police Academy. <laughs> Can, is that the beatboxing guy? Which is the beatboxing guy? Michael Winslow. Michael Winslow, Yes. God, I hope he's still with us. No, I believe he is. Uh, yeah, I really hope everyone just finds another country that's cheaper and goes there instead. Because man, sometimes I go to the record stores here and there's just like guys literally buying like piles. Yeah. People will blow out a cash register for like literally 15 to 20 minutes. It's crazy. You know, media of all kinds, old media of all kinds is just skyrocketing. So like I bought an old Walkman for a project that I'm working on right now. And I like after I got it, it, like one of the first Walkmans, the TPS L2. Is this Walkman, the right? Star Lord project, Matt? It is. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm building a spacecraft, and I'm going to defend the galaxy. I'm going to be a guardian of the galaxy. No, it's and the, so I get this thing, and I get it repaired, I get it working, and then I'm like, oh wait, I need tapes, and I don't know if you have been in the market for cassette oh, tapes no. recently, but they're going, they're going for absurd sums of no, money. No, everyone, all the record stores here in Tokyo are like pushing this like vintage cassette market agenda, which I am firmly against, but I mean, it can't be stopped. You know, cassettes have, cassettes always sucked. Like records were like inconvenient, but they, they sounded really good. If you had a system like arguably better than anything digital, if you're that, you know, sort of person, tapes never sounded good, right? No, you could put tape over the two little holes on the top and like tape over them. That's about the only <laughs> useful thing you could do. That actually, the, the best thing about tape was throwing away the label and like making your own crazy like mixtapes with like your own art on them and like like pastiche gluing like little collages and things in there and then the tape would get stuck in the heads and it would chew your tape up and it would be ruined and useless the pencil patrick are you you, are you feeling me you had to use the pencil to kind of rewind you had to stick it through one of those little gears do you remember i'm cool with vhs i have a lot of vinyl records but i mean cassette tapes man that's just a bridge too far no thanks but it literally takes up shelf space in stores now now it's like check out our cassette well, it's funny because I was listening, you know, I was, I, I got a Maria Takeuchi tape. I finally got a Maria Takeuchi tape. I wanted to get a tape that was of the era because this Walkman was like really popular in 1980. And I was listening to it and I was like, wow, this is really bad sound quality. Like Part of it's the tape. Part of it is this archaic device I'm playing it on. And I had forgotten just how much in times of old, when you were using headphones that were just those kind of foam ones that sat in your ears, you can hear people around you can hear everything. Like now we have these earbuds 
earbuds and it's like perfectly sealed in there and you can like blast your music and there's no, you can't really tell what anybody else is listening no leakage, to. Yeah. When you were listening to an original Walkman, like every, it's basically the same volume outside and inside the headphone. It's, it's pretty amazing. I don't feel like you can really hear like Japanese city pop music in its prime unless you hear it on eight track on a 2XL. So that might be the best way to do it. I thought you were going to say quadraphonic. You need to get one of those, one of those speakers in each corner of the room. It's not even surround sound. I actually, I, I wanted to get YMO's uh, solid state survivor and like walk around listening to that. But the solid state survivor tapes are like a hundred bucks now. I mean, I'm not, I refuse. I, I absolutely refuse to pay a hundred dollars for any kind of audio cassette. I won't do it. That's your bridge too far is any kind of tape. Mine is a tape that costs more than like 99 cents. I don't know. It ain't right. To kind of circle this back around now that we've like touched on every form of, of public, you know, electronics and, you know, streaming and everything. When those Chica Idols, they got banned in, in 2010 or whatever year it was. And all of these ordinances started to come out. And I people are saying the same thing is going to happen with the nuisance streamers. Like it's only a matter of time before, you know, Congress, who, 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 how it's done, how it's, in, how, we know how it's going to be enforced. It's going to be enforced by the cops. But I think pretty soon they're going to come down really hard on this kind of public nuisance stuff because it's one thing Japan cannot stand, which is people who kind of mess up the public order. I feel seen, Matt. Well, you know, we, you know, you say that, you know, we're being all edgy for our, our listeners, you know, because we want them to think that we're so cool and dark, edgy, gothic, you know, us. But in reality, you know, you and I, we have never, ever, ever like done anything to kind of disrupt our surroundings. Other, I mean, our identities by themselves cause violence. That That is... <laughs> That's true. But like, we've never actually gone out of our way to like mess anybody's day up. Have you? Have you? I, I of course haven't. not. The worst we've done is like walk around and like mumble into a digital recorder, I think, like in places like Nakano Broadway or at a cafe nearby or something like that. I may have body checked an elementary schooler out of the way because I wanted the last Godzilla vinyl on the peg at the toy wow. store. Like, I may. No, I've never. And if that. we needed money back then, we wouldn't like do any like nuisance streaming. We would just like sell our old toys and goods like at the counter there <laughs> yes, for like exactly. beer money yeah, that's what I should just I should just walk around you know around my toy collection and be like you want this you want who wants this going once going twice an asphalt jungle an urban skyline of fear waiting watching destroying the police are powerless the courts turn them loose it's happening everywhere it's happening this minute you're not safe anymore their numbers are growing, and you must wage a war wait, wait. to stop them. Vigilante rated R. Well, that about wraps it up for episode 67 of the Pure Tokyo Scope podcast. Want to thank everyone who listens to our show, everyone who donates to our nuisance streams, everyone who donates to our fist fights on the train platforms, that kind of thing. Patrick and I are vigilantes of love for you. We do it all for you. So yes, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you to the two people who will remain unnamed who I was uh, hanging out with yesterday who said that they had listened to every single one of these 60 seven podcasts i was touched was that mom and dad i live this patrick i live this so please continue to listen to our show thanks so much spread the word spread the love and we'll catch you all next time catch you next time